The program we developed in the last session consisted of many small bits and pieces. In this session we are going to develop a fundamental structuring mechanism based on blocks and lexical scoping that will help us clean up our program, make it more modular and easier to use. We are going to apply that mechanism to our previous square root function. It's good programming style, in particular in functional programming, to split up a task into many small functions. But on the other hand, names like square root iter improve and is good enough, they really matter only for the implementation of square root, not for its usage. Normally we would not like users to access these functions directly, so we want to avoid namespace pollution where they would see these names even though they're not supposed to be uh, called directly by them. One way we can achieve that is to put these auxiliary functions inside the function square root. So let me show that you that with m with the worksheet. Uh, what we have here so far is uh, all these functions are uh, separate uh, and visible on the top level. So what I want to do now is I take my definition of square root and I wrap it around the functions that are on the inside here. So I do it like that. I reformat, and there, what do we see? So we see the function square root that now contains square root iter is good enough and improve as well as the return value of square root. The return value here comes last. What that means is that now our program is much cleaner. The only function that's seen from the outside is square root. We still have very good names for the individual sub-steps, but those are accessible only from inside this algorithm. So the way we did that was using a block. A block is delimited by braces and it contains a number of definitions and at uh, its last element an expression that defines the return value, the result of that block. So here you see a simple example. We have a def definition of val x as a, uh, the result of f of 3 and we return x times x. Blocks are themselves expressions in Scala, so they can be used everywhere other expressions can be used including the right-hand side of a function definition. That's what we have seen in the Eclipse example here, where this block here was the return expression of the function square root. Now, an interesting aspect of blocks is how they affect visibility of identifiers in a program. There are two simple rules. The first is the definitions inside a block are only visible from within the block, not from the outside. The second rule is that definitions from outside the block are visible in the block as long as they are not shadowed by definitions of the same names inside the block. Uh, so that means that, for instance, here the name f is visible in the block. It refers to this outer block uh, name f. But the name x here refers to the inner name x, not the outer name x. The inner name x shadows the occurrence of the outer name. Let's do an exercise. Uh, I take a small variation of the program you've just seen. The question is, what is the value of result in this program? Possible answers are here. Think about it and pick one. So let's see how we would find the answer to that one. Uh, if we look at the value of result, then what we see is that the first thing we do is we compute a value of x to be f of 3. f is this function here. It uh, adds 1 to its parameter, so that would be give x uh, for x the value of 4. So then the value of x times x would be 16. And we take that value and add x to it. What's the value of x here? Well, we're now outside the block, so the value of x here is no longer visible. And the value we do see here is this, this first definition, so that would be 0. So the answer of the whole expression, the result of the whole expression, is 16. So we've seen that definitions of outer scopes are visible inside a block unless they're shadowed. We can use that to simplify square root by eliminating redundant occurrences of the x parameter, which means everywhere the same thing. So what you see here in the worksheet is that the x parameter that comes into square root is duplicated here, here, and here. But it's never changed. It's always passed as it is before. So we can simply eliminate it, all these occurrences here. 
and eliminate the corresponding parameter in the application. And we have the same version of square root, but now it's much cleaner. We have avoided the redundancy of passing the parameter x around everywhere by using the simple trick that the value of x is actually visible inside all these nested functions. So that gives you another reason for nesting things. It's not just namespace control, but it's also reusing outer definitions without passing them explicitly in parameters. Okay, one thing we haven't mentioned so far were semicolons, simply because so far we haven't seen them. Even though in Java every statement would be terminated by a semicolon, in Scala they are in most cases optional. You could have written val x equals 1 with a semicolon, but most people would omit that. The only situation where you really need a semicolon is if you want to put several definitions or expressions on one line. Uh, then the semicolon is needed to separate them. So for instance here you have a value definition of y equals x plus 1 and then a use of the variable y in a subsequent expression and you need the semicolon here to separate the two. Being able to commit semicolons at the end of lines is very co convenient, but there's one issue with it. How would you write an expression that spans several lines? To see the problem, consider this expression here, some long expression, then it's continued on the second line with plus some other expressions. That would actually be interpreted by the Scala compiler as two expressions. The first expression is the sum wrong expression, then it would be the implied semicolon, and then comes plus with the other expression. There are two ways to overcome this problem. You could write the multi-line expressions in parentheses, because semicolons are never inserted inside a pair of parentheses. So you could write sum wrong expression plus some other expression as long as you put it in parents, then that's fine. Or the other way to do that is to write the operator on the first line as the last word on the first line, because this tells the Scala compiler that the expression is not yet finished. So if a line ends in an infix operator, the Scala will compiler will assume that the next line forms part of the same expression. So to summarize what we've seen this week, you've seen simple elements of functional programming in Scala. Arithmetic and Boolean expressions, conditional expressions, if then else, functions with recursion, nesting and lexical scope. You've learned the difference between call by name and call by value evaluation strategies. And I believe most importantly, you've learned a way to reason about program execution. You can now reduce expressions using the substitution model. That model will be an important tool for the coming sessions.